about today's uh, speaker? Well, I had prepared something to say, but I'm going to keep it very brief. Um, I think it's very timely that we have her here uh, one week after Nelson Mandela passed away because our focus is sharpened at this time. For many of us in this room, you know, we're reflective, we're thinking about things that we've done as individuals, et cetera, things that we've done as groups. We're thinking about the significance of Nelson Mandela, the significance of the anti-apartheid movement, the significance of parallel movements, uh, the similarities with the Palestinian struggle, the differences, the successes, the challenges. And so our speaker today is somebody who I think is a very relevant speaker to have at this time because of the issues that she tackles in her work, the issues that relate to racism, classism, sexism, and she deals with them in a very sharp and critical way, whether it's through poetry or through uh, critical writing for Al Jazeera or through her latest, her novel, um, Mornings in Janine. So I think that's all I'm gonna say, but thank you for coming and please give her a, a warm welcome. Thank you, Samira, and thank you all so much for braving this um, this weather outside. I generally hibernate in the winter time, um, but I'm delighted to be here um, with all of you at the uh, Jerusalem Fund. Um, I think most of you probably know me as uh, a novelist and as a um, political commentary uh, writer, but actually poetry is what I have written the most of in my life. Um, I, I, uh, when I was very young, I used to write um, poetry in Arabic. And um, I thought that I would um, start off today by just reading the opening that, that sort of deals with, um, uh, with that writing at an early age. So this is actually the, it's a very short foreword in the beginning of the book. It's called A Note Before You Read On. I wrote poetry before I wrote anything else, poems in Arabic to be precise. I wrote them as a child. They were sophomoric, I'm sure, and they're all long gone. About a crush I had on our Iraqi neighbor, Gamal. About Ghadir, the mean girl in first grade who used to pull one of my pigtails down. I didn't know how to fix it, and I had to endure the day with lopsided hair. About my first grade Arabic teacher, I don't remember her name, who was so nice to me. And the bus driver, who stopped to get me ice cream one day after dropping everyone else off. He told me that I was special. I told him that, that he was special too, and he smiled beautifully. At 43 years old, I still remember his face and see the love that poured from his eyes, as if I reminded him of a daughter or a granddaughter he had lost. I still think about him sometimes because love is never forgotten. I wrote poems about my teta and my uncle Jamal, with whom I shared a small room in Kuwait. Their snoring kept me up at night until the day I found myself without them and could not fall asleep without their sleeping noises. Then, long after I learned to sleep to silence, long after my exile brought me to foreignness in English, I woke up one day and understood that Arabic had been stolen from my tongue. Or maybe it ran away of its own accord, like a neglected child might do. I miss it terribly, and I have phantom pains where those poems used to be before they were amputated as I slept to silence. I found new words to put to the language inside of me, and I did it always in private and in secret. I only wrote when I was in love or in pain, which were often one and the same. This is a selection of poems that I created over the course of five years. I've decided to publish them with gratitude to all the readers who have allowed me into their hearts and thoughts over the years. Um, so that's a basic um, summary of what this collection is all about. Um, you know, poetry tends to be a very, uh, um, it's a very vulnerable place for, for writers, at least for me. Um, so it was a actually a very big step for me to make, um, to publish these and make them public. Um, I have hundreds of them and they're all in a private blog and these are ones that I selected um, from there. Um, there. There are two poems in this collection that were actually made into videos. Uh, one of them is called Wala, um, and I was involved in the making of that video. Um, I want to start out with that poem 
um, showing it to you in, in video form. Um, it, it speaks to um, the hundreds of thousands uh, of what hundreds of thousands of Palestinian laborers um, go through on a daily basis. Um, as most of you know, Palestine is more or less being wiped off the map, and it's, uh, I feel, Israel's um, dream to have all the land with small isolated cantons um, that would contain a broken, subjugated population from which Israel can draw a cheap labor force that they can, um, that will come and work in Israel in the day and then go back um, into their enclaves and not, um, not dilute the Jewish nature of, of that state. So um, let me, I'm just gonna play this here for you. So this is called wala. Um, wala, as many of you know, is the Arabic word for boy. It's 3 a.m. in the cattle cage. The line is long and thick with bodies. You wait. A jibna sandwich with cucumber in a plastic bag clutched in your callous laborer's hand. Your wife prepared your breakfast and your lunch. She was up before you, and together you prayed a pre-dawn salat. She kissed your face and said, Allah ma'ak ya habibi. Allah be with you, my love. You kiss the faces of your sleeping babies. You haven't seen them awake in months, and you wonder, has Walid's voice begun to crack yet? Have Wijdad's hips begun to flare? How big was Suraya's smile when she came home with her report card? It's 4 a.m. in the cattle cage. Still, you wait. The line before you is so long, and behind you now it is longer. Few of you speak. You're packed so damn tight that you hold one another upright. You see your own fatigue reflected in the weariness etched on the faces all around you. You look away, pine for a smoke. But who the hell can afford that? You stare at the graffiti beyond the iron bars holding you in, written just for you, written by Zionist settlers sucking the breath from your lungs, you understand the meaning of their English words, die, sand niggers. Sometimes you pine for that too. It's 5 a.m. in the cattle cage. The soldiers arrive. The line loosens. You take one step forward, propelled by the weight of the bodies behind you. Your jibna sandwich with cucumber in a plastic bag is crushed. It never survives. It's 7 a.m. in the cattle cage. Now is your turn. You produce your papers, unfold, refold, eyes down, heart down, your shoes are down on their luck. But you're out of the line now. Fifteen men before you were pulled aside and you tried not to look. Tried not to hear the one yelling, don't hit me. It's 7.30 a.m. on the cattle bus and you ride. The country they stole from you speeds outside your window and you imagine the man you would have been. The man you should have been out there riding the family steed, the thoroughbred mares your grandfather raised and nurtured and loved in a Palestine, unraped, unstolen. It's 8 a.m. You get off the cattle bus. Your crushed jibna sandwich with cucumber in a plastic bag in one hand. Your eyes down, your heart down. You put your toolbox down to knock on the Zionist settler's back door where the help goes. But the Zionist settler boss man yells, Voila! Mishon el Not there today, boy. And all you can do is thank Allah 
that your wife and your babies are not there to hear them call you Wella. So, um, as many of you know, um, I've uh, written uh, a bit about um, anti-black racism um, that uh, pervades nearly every aspect of American society and beyond. And um, uh, even, of course, in, in the Arab American community. Um, on a on a personal level, um, I feel a great affinity towards uh, various African cultures, and in particular, African American cultures. Um, and on a political level, uh, I feel um, an even greater affinity because I feel like there are a lot of parallels um, between the two struggles. And um, the the next poem uh, that I um, that I want to show you, I'll, this is the other one that was made into a video, is called um, is called Black. Um, oh, by the way, thanks for everybody who's tweeting from here. I don't know who it is, but it, my phone keeps <laughs> vibrating. I'm, I got to get rid of this. Um, I I think that the uh, the African American struggle in this country has been one of the most important, if not the most important, um, contributor to social evolution in the United States um, and also to the cultural depth um, in this country. And um, so with these thoughts in mind, I, I wrote this next poem. Um, it was a video. I recorded several, uh, several of these poems in, in a studio. and. Um, this video was made by a friend of mine in, in Gaza, and I really want to plug her. Her name is Aya Zinati. Um, she did this entirely as a labor of love uh, for me as a gift. Um, and what's even more remarkable is that she was doing it between 20-hour uh, power outages in Gaza. So um, I'm hugely grateful for her. I think she did a wonderful job. Um, in the beginning of this video, that's she's Aya is the is the person who opens um, in the video. So, Jordan was black, and she was become Palestinian. Like my sister Suhair Hamad, I was born Palestinian, and I am become black. But is that really so? My hair is straight-ish. My skin is brown. My nose is big and long, crooked and pointy, and all kinds of fucked up still. I can access white privilege if I want. But that would be worse would rip my soul, so I search for the black in me. I find it in the Ethiopian women enslaved by my Arab forefathers who lost their identities, gave birth to Arab babies, and injected Africa into my veins. I find it in the white supremacy that raped me. I find it when a European took my grandma's house, painted my country white, kicked us out to the cold curb, killed our neighbors, cut my brother's balls off, motherfuckers fucked my mother, then dragged me by the hair and told me that I needed liposuction and a nose job. 
It is where I believed that I was ugly when I tried to be white. When I put down my flatbread and picked up a fork and Mrs. Wall said that I was white enough to stop being a nigger lover. I find it where white boys dug up my ancestors' bones, built a tolerance museum over their graves in Jerusalem, put on a uniform and held me at gunpoint for a laugh because little white girls pushed me out of the pool one day screaming mean things at me in Hebrew. I feel it in the way my Arab brethren considered me human only after I got a USA passport because otherwise I am vermin that they can feel sorry for and be outraged about. A thing fit for refugee camps that aren't fit for humans and good for cheap labor or a cheap whore. I find it in the dictates that I am the wrong kind of human. I find it because I am Palestinian and Jesus was Palestinian and Jesus was black. I find black from the poetry in my heart the song on my lips and the music in my hips. I am Palestinian, and in the bruise of my heart, I am become black, because black is beautiful, and the beautiful in me is black. say something else um, as an uh, extension to this um, you know as, as a writer um, I feel that cultural resistance is a really important part of the Palestinian struggle that often um, is uh, really not talked about very much and one of the things that I um, try to do through my writing through my poetry fiction and, and nonfiction political commentary is to um, is to try and point out the the kind of conversation that you know every struggle has a conversation with the world, and for for me, um, I see that the conversation we have with the world as Palestinians is very Eurocentric, it's very Anglocentric, and it's very humiliating to me um, because I feel it it goes something along the lines of hey, look at me, I'm a human, I'm just like you, I'm, I'm worthy, you know, it's this, it's this constant sort of, you know, uh, trying to prove our humanity, trying to prove that we are worthy of, of basic rights and so forth. And I don't like engaging in it, um, it, it because frankly, I feel like um, not only is it is it futile and not only is power really not moved by moral imperative. But we do have natural allies all over the world. Um, I feel like most of those are people of color. Um, that isn't to say that there aren't a lot of uh, uh, white people in the world, um, Europeans and Americans who are truly standing in solidarity with us. But the power structure has a certain look um, and it generally does not encompass people of color and I feel like um, we don't we don't put our energies enough towards uh, African nations toward nations in South America and Southeast Asia where where we do where the conversation is actually very different um, and it's not a conversation that we have to preface uh, with with certain explanations and proof of our humanity and so forth um, you know, there's so many examples. I mean, just I'll just a couple. Um, y you know, when when uh, UNESCO admitted um, Palestine as a member, as you all know, the United States withdrew all funding. The first country to step up with money to offset the loss of of uh, money from the United States was uh, Gabon, the African nation of Gabon. No, most of us don't even know that. Um, there's a 
do you guys know who Muhammad Durra is, right? Um, the, the the boy in Gaza who who was shot um, <coughs> with his father. Uh, it's it's an iconic image of uh, during the outbreak of of the second intifada. There's a mural. Um, uh, it, there's a huge mur mural in in the middle uh, in the middle of a city, and it's not anywhere in the Arab world. It's not anywhere in Europe. Not even in Palestine. It's it's in Mali. So it, you know there I can go through so many examples, and not to mention the multitude of African American and African personalities um, who have stood with us very publicly. Um, of course, Nelson Mandela is one of them, much to the consternation of, of the most uh, powerful nations in the world. So, you know, I'd just like to put that out there um, to, to, uh, to my Palestinian countrymen and, um, and all the people who love us and stand with us is something to, to consider and to think about. As we as we orient our struggle and are constantly trying to find the right path and the most effective path. Um, another theme in this collection of poetry uh, deals with um, women and patriarchy. And by the way, um, I should have warned you all, I guess, before about some of the adult language content in here. I saw some eyebrows raised <laughs> at some of the words. Um, this this uh, next poem <coughs> speaks to um, the struggles of women um, and patriarchy. Um, but before I read it, um, you know, I was just made aware of a recent um <coughs> uh, conference, a Palestinian conference in Doha, uh, and you know, the first question I asked was, you know, were were women and young people well represented? And, and the answer was no. And I think this is another um, problem in the orientation of our struggle is, is um, you know, women are at least half of the population. Um, and our, and at, at this conference at least, um, which was a pretty high level conference uh, as I understand, um, their voices were remarkably underrepresented as were the voices of, of young people, which I think is so um, important. And I was going to actually plug this book um, Precisely as uh, you know, as, as voices of young people, Gaza writes back that Samir already told you about. Um, there's another book too, and I know this is unorthodox, and my publisher is going to kill me for plugging another book that we have nothing to do with. But I just finished this book called um, Shadow Lives by um, Victoria Britton, uh, a renowned reporter, that um, uh, deals with ta th uh, the effects of the so-called war on terrorism, and it's done through the eyes uh, of the women who were affected, whose husbands, fathers, and, and sons, and <coughs> um, uh, brothers were, were locked up uh, in Guantanamo. And it really, uh, it's, it's a devastating book, and it's stunning in, in many ways, so I, I recommend it um, <coughs> on that topic of women. Okay, so this poem is called Sister Palestinian, and, um, you know, another disclaimer, there's, uh, there's adult language in here. Sister Palestinian, your fate was written the day you played hopscotch, when they pulled the land from under your feet. So you carried your country on your back in the bags handed to you on the long march to oblivion. When your father, king of his castle, was forced to sleep on dirt, you served him coffee and scrubbed his feet to save his pride. When your mother went mad, and died with anguish, your tears watered a refugee's garden. Someone put two gold bracelets on your wrists, the braided bangles that we all wear, and you stared at them on your wedding night as you gripped the bedposts with white knuckles. The first time your husband hit you, it nearly knocked the country off your back. But your first baby was a promise too precious, so you sewed Palestine to your skin. When he came back from Israel's prison, you tenderly dressed his wounds, kissed them, and you prayed for him. You loved him, and he left five months after your second daughter was born. 
European women, he said, knew how to please a man. He said, you had never really been an exciting fuck. He didn't mind that European women could not pronounce his name. He never knew about his third daughter, whom you named Feirouz, for the voice that was your only solace. When another of history's storms raised your house, the winds carried you to foreign lands, and you were at home in the devastating freedom of answering to no one. When then you became an exciting fuck, you found yourself searching over and over for some meaning in the heartbreak of an empty orgasm. The girls you raised were not Palestinian. The house you built was not yours. The country tethered to your skin sags as if a body of sorrow. You deserve better, sister. Come back in another life to a country that holds you, a man who honors the language of your heart, and daughters who will sing for you a Palestinian lullaby before you sleep. Um, and on this same topic um, of uh, women in the struggle, um, there's another poem uh, called Sister Palestinian Part Two. <laughs> I'm not very good with uh, titles. We swim on the surface of this frozen dream, passing one another, lost. Beyond the cold crust lies a country siphoned from our veins where the hills of God are carved and paved and apartheid metastasizes into the wadis through the sanasal and the precious groves. I see you clawing at the ice, jabbing with the jag of your broken bones, with the aimless bullet of the sun coaxing with the heat of the dawn, the wreckage of the day, the silent despair of uprooted trees might there be mercy for us. Perchance, Ten more will not lose a limb today. Thousands will not leave school to scrounge for food. Perchance, Lena will marry instead of committing suicide. And Ahmed will dream tonight instead of shivering in his own piss. I see you, sister. Your eyes make me despise the ghurba soaking my skin. And I tear at my tongue to rip the English it planted in this manufactured fate. I don't want this world of deceit and theft, sister. Sit with me on the floor of our damnation. I've made plates of zayt and za'atar, eggs and fried tomatoes, and there is bread from the ruins of the tabun. We can eat like the fallahat that we are, sing Palestine's ballads as death rolls, shoots, marches, and flies through her. Sit with me. Let us eat and sing bear witness and love through this winter. Okay, so um, I, uh, I want to um, uh, introduce another theme in the book um, of uh, you know, timeless uh, topic or theme of love in poetry. Um, how are we doing on time, by the way? I have no, it's good, yeah, okay. So I wanted to say, you know, we're kind of an in intimate group. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna break pretty soon. And then if you guys have questions, if not, I'll just keep, uh, I'll just keep going. Sound good? I haven't put you to sleep yet, have I? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see here. All right, this is a, a very short one. Um, it's called Untitled and Unfinished. In a, in a room of flags and books, the country in my blood reached across the ocean to turn my head. When, a snow, when snow carpeted the streets, a fireplace lit my heart. And when the moon called, the ocean swept me away. There are a thousand ways to love, and I loved him 10,000 ways. Um, Okay, uh, this is um, a story of uh, love or loss of love. It's called What I Did Today for Tomorrow. I peeled our shadows from the street and made of them a dress to wear to his birthday party. 
I found the moon in my chest and went there to be alone. I don't oblige much anymore because I can't, but I'm not so foolish to think I truly can't. So today I summoned a few things. I climbed onto my name and watched from afar, unseen. I closed my eyes, the better to see his face. His hands gripped my waist and we kissed with that hunger I've come to know. I tilted my head, felt his lips on my neck, and I ached a desperate and unforgiving ache. But I couldn't see anything more, and I couldn't remember either, and I can't finish this poem. Okay, um, just a uh, question. Have any of you um, read this? Any, any? Nobody, okay. I was gonna take uh, requests if anybody had any. Um, let me just open it up to questions if, um, if any of you have. Political. Did you uh, write in Arabic and then translate it? What's, what's your mode <laughs> mod of apparent? Yeah. Um, no, I, I write exclusively in English now. Um, <coughs> you know, I came to the United States when I was 13. And um, so my education in Arabic sort of ended there, and uh, it was it's 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 arrested development. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I read Arabic and I write Arabic, but uh, I don't feel confident enough that it's sufficiently sophisticated to, you know, write on on an expressive level. This may be a little bit of a stretch, but um, I've been becoming more interested in the experience of uh, Palestinians in the 48 territories mm -hmm. because um, I'm an activist, and so of course we tend to go for the dramatic and the you know and the heart wrenching and and, uh, and their story is much less dramatic it seems, and I thought you know for a poet. Um, you would be able to get at it, and what you what, what mm. do you think about about sort of their particular um, yeah. part of this story? Yeah, I actually, I, I disagree that their story is not as dramatic. I think it's very dramatic. Um, uh, you know, Palestinians in, in forty eight um, for many years lived under martial law, and they, um, you know, they're they're treated as you know second, third, fifth class citizens. Um, and they also suffer from a, s a disconnect too from 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 the larger Palestinian society. So one of the things that the occupation has um, done in a very effective way was not just to fragment Palestinian society geographically, but also psychologically. Um, and so you have um, much in the way that I think this happens with a lot of other struggles. There's sort of a, a, a gradation of Palestinianness, you know, um, with with those who are living. Um, under occupation being sort of, you know, the quintessential Palestinians. Um, but, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't really um, subscribe to that. We, we're all Palestinian and, and we all have our own um, narrative and it's all part of the larger narrative of, of dispossession, of exile, of, of oppression, and, uh, and loss of, of country, loss of home. For the 1948 Palestinians, uh, you know, if it, frankly, if it weren't for them, the whole myth of a land without a people, for a people without a land, um, would have, you know, uh, would have proven a, a, a reality because, but, you know, they, they're the ones who stayed and um, they sort of, you know, held the fort, so to speak. So I, you know, I very much um, feel that they are a very important part of Palestinian society, um, and their story is dramatic in its own way. Their narratives, and um, but being a, a sort of a Palestinian in the diaspora, I admit um, not being as connected to their narrative. Um, and when Mornings in Janine was was published, um, a good friend of mine, um, the uh, who who's since passed away. Um <coughs> Uh, Dr. Jabur Khoury sort of lamented the lack of, uh, you know, 48 Palestinians being depicted in, in novels. And um, so, 
I think that's definitely something that um, is important uh, on a cultural resistance level is to uh, include those narratives as, as equally um, important. So I don't know what just happened there between. <laughs> 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 cool, excellent. I love unifying people. Well, thank you so much for your poems, and thank you to the Palestinian Center for another wonderful event. I will just mention a, a, a tiny uh, fragment of what I want to say because I don't want to monopolize the microphone. Uh, you know, I think that you are proof that no technological gadget, no staging can compare to the power of the word. And such is the case that if you couple that with the uh, misinformation in the United States media, which is characterized mainly by omissions, you should have as much time as all the networks in the US and radios have <laughs> to counterweight the misinformation. And if I can give you another example, since you mentioned Mandela, uh, so much has been said about Mandela and South Africa. Nowhere, nowhere is it mentioned that it was the key the key event was the total defeat of the South African Infantry and Air Force in Angola in December of 1988 by the Cuban Armed Cuban, Forces. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, see that? And I, I was in Paris when uh, um, Mandela was released, and they asked him, what kept you so strong in jail? Mm -hmm. And he said, a portrait of Fidel Castro that I had in the war. Yeah, yeah. So this is another example of misinformation. So I think that uh, your work, uh, you know, should be carried as far as we can in the whole world. However, I do have a question. You mentioned something about the discourse in other parts of the world being different from the U.S. And it is understandable because no country in the, in, in the history of humanity has had such a racist establishment, including the laws, which were copied by South Africa, by the way, to, to, to establish apartheid. Now, I don't know whether you can elaborate, this is very complicated, but you mentioned that the discourse is different in South America and Southeast Asia, and people don't preface their statements mm -hmm. uh, regarding the ethnic relations. Could you try yeah. to elaborate on that? Thank yeah. you. Um, absolutely, but I've heard I want to say something. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right about the, the Cuban contribution to, uh, to the war in Angola. Um, I think, I, I believe it was a contingent of 50,000 Cuban troops that were sent uh, well, there, and you're, I believe you. They, in there's a there's a um, a place in Pretoria called Freedom Park um, that it's 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 a, it's a monument to um, the various wars and struggles for for freedom, uh, and there's an entire wall dedicated to all the names of the Cuban fighters, and that's where I was getting the fifty thousand from because I think there are that many names. I, I may be mistaken about the number, but it was a huge and important contribution. You're right, so I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so regarding the discourse, um, so one of the things, you know, the if you, not even the average American, if you if you consider a conversation with reasonably well-educated Americans um, who, who you would sort of assume have some idea about the world and, and, um, and history. There is, you know, th the conversation inevitably turns to, well, where's your Nelson Mandela? And why, you know, what's with the suicide bombs? And, um, well, you know, isn't it true that you want to push people, push Jews into the sea? You know, it's, it's these, it's these um, ridiculous myths that are perpetuated over and over. The rest of the world doesn't, never believe those things, and they understand them not, sp sp they understand them not to be true. And this is specifically true in countries um, th that have been colonized, in countries that have experienced apartheid. So, you know, when I was in South Africa, nobody, nobody questions, you know, one's right to, to armed um, resistance. It's just, you know, uh, as a matter of fact, <coughs> one of the questions I got was, you know, why, why haven't you taken up arms again? <laughs> it's, I mean, they, they sort of object to the 
um, the, the sort of the movement of, of passive resistance at the moment. So that's what I mean. It's a completely different conversation. It's a completely different discourse um, than, than one that I feel we have um, with the centers of power, it li which, like I said, to me feel humiliating. Because I, you know, I don't think we should ever um, put ourselves in situations where we have to prove that we're human, that we have to prove that you know we're worthy of human rights, and and I, I understand the strategic um, thinking around these conversations, but you know, this is one woman's opinion, and um, and it's informed by by my feelings on the conflict, by my understanding of history. Um, but then again, you know, nobody elected me and I don't speak for anybody else, but I do feel like um, the, the, the Eurocentric orientation uh, of, of our struggle is, is problematic. So thank you for, for raising that one. Yes. Uh, thanks for coming in and, and addressing us, and thanks again to the uh, to the Palestinian Center for for, for holding this. Um, I've noticed in in the uh, poems that you read um, uh, a certain emphasis on identity. In your case, on on your identity as a Palestinian, your identity as a woman. But I hear also strains of um, of thought about your identity as a poet, and I hear lines about the writing of poetry. So, I wonder if you could address just for a second. Um, the, the harmony or the or the disharmony between those those two strains um, you know I'm not I'm not sure that I can separate words from anything in my life anymore um, you know this is words are how we all make sense of our of our world more or less um, and I think that's particularly uh, the case um, with somebody like me who who puts her thoughts and her feelings and um, on paper through words? So um, you know they're they're really inseparable. I'm not sure that they're um, they're out of sync with each other. Or, um, but on the topic of language in general, um, even though language is, I think, what what gives what gives our thoughts a certain structure, a certain amount of structure. Um, in that same way that it gives structure to our feelings and our thoughts, I think it can be limiting too, because you know language is um, uh, it has boundaries, um, and it's bounded by words and and the the weight that words have, and and I think this is this is a, a concept that becomes evident when you speak more than one language. Um, so when you see the difficulty translating, you know from one language to another, uh, whereas you know certain words have a particular meaning and weight and cultural resonance that they don't necessarily in another, um, in another language. So, um, so, so there's, there's that limitation, but also I think, and this is probably getting way off topic the <laughs> from poetry, but I think language sometimes can um, not only is it sort of the, the what, what what gives structure to our thoughts, but sometimes I think language can structure and turn our thoughts. So one example is um, you know the the much hated Ayn Rand, um, uh, in, in in her book, um, was it uh, Fountainhead? Yeah, um, she sort of, uh, and I, it's been ages since I read this, but she you know. She sort of teaches selfishness as a virtue, as, um, and she describes it through, um, you know, a concept of, uh, of holding on to the self and and being protective of the self, and, and you know, when I thought about that, it, it occurred to me that someone who speaks Arabic, probably would not conceive of such a philosophy because the word selfishness doesn't have the word self in it, you know, bukhul bakhil. It it has not. It, so bakhil, yeah, it doesn't have ananiya. ananiya what I, but I, uh, yeah, but it, it. But the word self, um, nafs, you know, and nafs is not part of. It's not part of the the word selfish. 
So, so it, it was just, a, just you know, an example that occurred to me once that how language itself can give structure, can, can bring up ideas. So, anyway, that's, <laughs> that's way off topic, but um, it, it, deals with, it deals with, uh, you know, the magic of words, I think. I kind of wanted to follow up a little bit uh, um, with the whole poetry aspect. I mean, clearly w words are really important for you and you can feel the um, careful choice of words and images as you go through your poetry, uh, as you read your poetry. What about, what about the, s the sort of the, um, the meter and the, uh, the way it flows? the way the words flow, the way they stop, the way they chop, the way mm -hmm. where they flow. What about that whole other sense of poetry, yeah. the rhythm um, of your poetry? Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, you know, I would like to, um, but the truth is I don't, I, I don't know. Um, I, much of the, I really am not, I'm not a person who thinks uh, structurally, I guess. Like I, I really have no um, under like, except by feel, you know. Like if you ask me to sort of diagram uh, where a sentence with various uh, grammar rules, I I, I'm, I don't know. I, I have n know very little about grammar. I know what sounds right, what feels right, um, and so when I write, I read things in my head or I read them out loud. And if something resonates, if I feel, I just keep working on it until it, it has the right rhythm, until it moves me emotionally. So I think, I mean, for me, that's my process. I, um, there are very few poems in here that rhyme. I think there's maybe two. Um, so I, it's not something that I concentrate on, um, that kind of structure. Um, I, m most things in my life I kind of do by feel, <laughs> trial and error. It's not, it's not always a good way to live and it's pr it can be precarious at times, but um, it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just the way it is for me. <laughs> you know, I want to say something else too about um, words, uh, especially in culture. Um, I think I think um, it's important, uh, precision is important um, because every work of art, every poem, every book will have a cultural legacy. And, you know, as I, as I get older, um, you know, I th and, and, and as a mother, I think about the cultural legacies and the social legacies of works of art um, and how, how they, can be internalized uh, by future generations. How am I depicting the women in a book, um, you know, physically, emotionally? Um, is it something that would I want my daughter to internalize this image? Um, so I think there's a level of, um, of humility and precision um, and endless rewriting that has to accompany um, works of poetry or uh, or prose um, for for that reason, um, because uh, you know what we populate our cultural legacies with is um, is going to be important. It is important. Can I ask just a question? I, I have a question actually, yeah. which is related to this, um, and I, I'm going to keep it brief. But have you had any interaction with other women of color writers? Like you, you refer to jo June Jordan, and I know she passed away some time ago. But did you ever know her or interact no. with her? Because no, I wish no. Um, I, uh, but yes, of course, I've had interaction with um, <coughs> uh, women of color who are artists, writers dancers, musicians, and so forth. Um, <coughs> I guess the most recent and, and uh, the biggest such gathering was the Time of the Writer uh, uh, Literature Festival in South Africa. Um, as a matter of fact, I was the only um, person, non-African uh, person 
who was invited, which you know speaks again to the kind of solidarity that is coming to us from Africa. Um, and and the, the organizers were urged to invite an Israeli since they were inviting me and they refused. So but again, I mean, there are countless examples of that kind of solidarity coming to us from, from Africa in particular that is not coming from anywhere else and um, something I hope you know more Palestinians take note of. Uh, yes, hi, uh, again. Um, I love the poems you read. I should have mentioned that the first time I had Thanks. the mic. Um, very powerful. Um, and I just wonder, as a, um, a cultural worker or whatever, um, when you express your truth in poetry, it seems like it's very hard. It would be hard in the conceptual world of other cultural workers in this society to go like, well, we don't accept that because of, you know, the because you're Palestinian and your story is just, you know, you've got it wrong. There's all these other things you're not saying or whatever. Um, so, but it's, it's a poem. It stands by itself and it's, it is your truth. Mm -hmm. How has, has that worked? I mean, do you find you're actually discriminated against by other people who love poetry and are into poetry, for instance, because yeah. they don't like your story? Um, well, like I said, uh, this is my first um, uh, poetry publication, so, um, but in general, I don't, um, you know, I don't feel discrimination from, from uh, other writers necessarily. Um, I think there's a general sort of structural discrimination um, in the publishing industry, uh, you know, uh, but luckily we, we have small presses like um, Just World Books. Um, which was formed precisely to address this problem in, in the publishing world that does not want to, um, that doesn't want to publish uh, words from people like me. Uh, so, and, and even like with Mornings in Janine, even though, you know, it's, it's been an international bestseller and it's, it's in um, 33 languages, it, I, I couldn't initially get it published in the United States. As a matter of fact, I had to go first. It was published in French, then Italian, um, and then through those translations, I was able to get a publisher in the UK who then, um, and through Bloomsbury, of course, I was published in Bloomsbury, US, but, um, <coughs> and even it was pu when it was, you know, published here, uh, nobody really wanted to review it. There was only one major um, publication review that looked at it. So there's definitely um, a, a sort of institutional unwillingness to, um, to take or to, you know, to include, I should say, uh, Palestinian narratives that are um, by Palestinian uh, authors and, and uh, poets. Um, you know, I've never been accosted or anything like that, but, you know, I mean, I have, you know, I've gotten nasty letters. We all get those nasty letters. I had a reading canceled one time because people protested. But, uh, you know, uh, truthfully, most of the, the, the reactions I've gotten have mostly been very supportive, um, including from people who, who knew nothing about, um, about, you know, Palestinian life. I mean, the, the letters are, are uh, there's a guest book on, on the book website that, um, that, you know, chronicles the letters that I've, get, that I've gotten uh, from all over the world, from people of different backgrounds, different faiths, and so forth. Which actually makes me feel like there really is a um, uh, a desire, at least in the Western world, to to understand what's happening better. Because I think there is a general um, <coughs> unease with what they're being told, and the sort of intuition that they, this isn't really everything. And I think this is wrong. But you know, there's uh, most people don't have the inclination to go and and research things and read nonfiction books and things like that. So I think that um, <coughs> cultural representations like novels, music, films, um, dance, all of these things uh, are, are important aspects of resistance. Um, not just to, like I said, convince, you know, people of our humanity, but, you know, but to, um, uh, 
but to like I said to, to populate our cultural legacies these are you know they're things for us for our own society and and they're bridges of solidarity with other peoples who are oppressed and who are struggling for for liberty and and universal human dignity um, Susan um, I shouldn't take up too much time but I, I'd love it if you could talk just a little bit about that time when a well-known writer did try to um, just completely dismiss your narrative and how it felt at the Boston Book Festival oh, to be oh on the stage <laughs> with Alan Dershowitz, oh kind of. <laughs> um, and, and then I really also want to say that I can't wait to see a movie made out of Mornings in Janine, and I just hope that the movie rights thing goes through somewhere, somehow, as soon as possible, because you're quite right. I mean, if you think of the, the influence that that terrible book and even worse movie, Exodus, has had mm -hmm. on the whole right. of U.S. culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, the movie of Mornings in Janine should be much more powerful. But tell yeah. us about how it was being up there with Alan Dershowitz. Uh, at first I wasn't sure. What writer are you talking about? Um, I'm not sure I consider him a writer. <laughs> um, yeah, he, he uh, I found myself, uh, he wrote, he wrote this uh, novel, um, about, <laughs> sorry, I, I, should, I need to be a little bit more gracious here. <laughs> um, he, he wrote a novel um, about this brilliant Jewish American lawyer <laughs> who um, h hobnobbed with, uh, you know, made U.S. politicians and U.S. presidents and was married to this um, incredibly gorgeous woman and everybody loved him. And um, and how he he basically saves the day in Palestine and and he's bringing peace and he's got some, you know he's got his Palestinian characters and and his uh, anyway so so his novel um, was you know filed in the category of Middle Eastern literature and um, and I was invited and I think I was the only other book that was in that category as well so they had a panel with the two a panel with the two of us and and um, you know it was. Uh, it's on YouTube. I don't know. <laughs> um, it was, y you know, th th the thing is, um, there were some things written about that afterwards, and, and one analyst um, was talking about how so many people were intimidated by Dershowitz and would not go up against him. Um, and I, you know, I, I feel that you know, when you have the truth on your side, when, when the messages that you are putting forth are ones um, of uh, human dignity, are ones of human rights, are uh, of an indigenous people's um, struggle against extinction, essentially. You know, I think if you, if you know the facts and, if, and, and you're comfortable in your own skin, you know, it's so easy to counter even the most powerful propagandist, um, because that's at the end of the day, their their arguments fall apart under uh, under the scrutiny of of under human scrutiny, under under the scrutiny of of the law, uh, of of simple concepts of decency and concepts of justice. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, yep, so I think our time is done. Thank you so much for coming. I'm, I'm hugely grateful. Thanks.